balancing unity among NAM and G77 plus China. The United Nations chief condemns collective punishment of Palestinians. Good afternoon and Salam alaikum. This is World Today. I'm Otto Othman. Now, Malaysia will call for enhancing unity and solidarity among developing countries of the Non Aligned Movement or NAM and Group of 77 Plus China, apart from strengthening multilateralism at the 19th NAM Summit and 3rd South Summit of the G77 Plus China in Kampala, Uganda, from 17th to 22nd January. The Malaysian delegation to the summit will be led by Deputy Foreign Minister Datuk Muhammad Alamin. Now, the country will also touch on key global and regional issues, including Palestine, the South China Sea, Islamophobia, 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, Climate Action, and Reform of International Financial Institutions. As a member of the NAM Ministerial Committee on Palestine, Malaysia will also make a strong representation of its position on Palestine and will advocate for Palestine's right to self-determination and nationhood. Malaysia's consistent participation in NAM and G77 plus China illustrates the country's steadfast commitment to strengthening South-South cooperation. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres has called for an immediate humanitarian ceasefire in the Gaza Strip as the fighting between Israel and Hamas passed the 100-day milestone. He also condemned the humanitarian situation in Gaza that he said was beyond words. Nothing can justify the collective punishment of the Palestinian people. The humanitarian situation in Gaza is beyond words. Nowhere and no one is safe. Traumatized people are being pushed into increasingly limited areas in the south that are becoming intolerably and dangerously congested. Guterres stressed that there is a need for an immediate humanitarian ceasefire to ensure sufficient aid gets to where it is needed. He added, with aid deliveries struggling to get through to the traumatized people, Gaza now faces the long shadow of starvation. The United Nations and aid groups warned that the war has created a humanitarian catastrophe for the 2.4 million people in the besieged strip and reduced much of the territory to rubble. Vowing to destroy Hamas, Israel launched a relentless military campaign that has killed more than 24,000 people in Gaza, mostly women and children. The UN said more than three months of fighting have displaced roughly 85% of the territory's population, crowded in shelters and struggling to get food, water, fuel and medical care. The World Health Organization said it needs $1.5 billion this year for life-saving and tens of thousands or tens of millions of people trapped in health emergencies, including in Ukraine and Gaza. The UN Health Agency warns that nearly 300 million people across the globe are expected to require humanitarian assistance and protection this year. WHO Chief Terdos Adalom Ghebreyesus said among them, an estimated 166 million people will need life-saving humanitarian health assistance. He said his agency is aiming to reach around 87 million of those most in need and would require $1.5 billion to do so. He added, as 2024 starts, WHO is already responding to 41 health crises, including 15 of the highest level emergencies. He warned that those caught up in such crises are facing a traumatic start to a new year, and it comes on the back of 2023, which was itself a year of immense and mostly avoidable suffering. Listing a long line of conflicts from Ukraine to Sudan to Gaza, he said that shockingly, one child in every five globally either lived in or fled from a conflict zone last year. Tedro stressed that for those facing emergencies, disruptions to essential health services often mean the difference between life and death. Switzerland has agreed to a request by Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky to host a peace summit of world leaders on ending Russia's full-scale invasion, but without inviting Moscow. 
Zelensky held talks with Swiss President Viola Amherd during a visit to Bern before heading to the World Economic Forum's annual meeting in the Swiss ski resort of Davos. He said the summit must energize everything that has already been achieved and must determine that the end of the war must be exemptionally just and the restoration of the force of international law must be truly complete. No time scale was given for when the summit might be held. The decision to hold a peace summit comes after national security advisers from 83 countries held a fourth round of talks on Sunday in Davos, seeking common ground on Ukraine's peace formula. February marks two years since Russia's war in Ukraine began, and Moscow has intensified its aerial assaults on Ukraine in recent weeks. Guatemala's new president, Bernardo Arevalo, promised to fight corruption and stand firm against global authoritarianism in his first speech after being sworn in. La crisis política de la que estamos emergiendo nos ofrece la oportunidad única de edificar una institucionalidad democrática robusta y saludable sobre los escombros de este muro de corrupción que estamos empezando a derribar ladrillo tras ladrillo. The 36-year-old former lawmaker, diplomat and sociologist pulled off a major upset when he swept from obscurity to win elections last August, firing up voters wary of graft in one of Latin America's poorest nations. He took the oath of office after warding off a barrage of attempts to prevent him from taking power, notably by prosecutors who have been accused of graft and are closely aligned with the country's entrenched political and economic ruling class. Eravalo takes over from Alejandro Diamete, under whom several prosecutors fighting craft were arrested or forced into exile. Guatemala, routinely ranked among the most corrupt countries in the world, is also one of Latin America's most unequal countries, a reality that has compelled hundreds of thousands to risk their perilous migrant journey to the United States in hopes of a better life. Forty-three prisoners remain at large after escaping a prison in northern Ecuador as security forces continued operations throughout the country. The recent explosion of violence, including the storming by gunmen of a live TV news broadcast, appears to be a response to President Daniel Noboa's plans to address Ecuador's serious security crisis. Police and military personnel are present in jails throughout Ecuador after some 200 kidnapped guards and administrative officials were freed from at least seven prisons over the weekend. The inmates escaped a jail in Esperaldas, a city close to the border with Colombia, after some 2,000 members of Ecuador's security forces conducted a search operation in the prison on Sunday. As a result of the inspection, the escape of 48 inmates was discovered before five prisoners were recaptured. The BOA declared a 60-day state of emergency last week, including a nighttime curfew, and designated 22 criminal groups as terrorists. Since the state of emergency was enforced, security forces have detained more than 1,500 people and have carried out 41 operations against terrorist groups. The government said operations will continue throughout Ecuador this week. An estimated 3.5 billion Britons living overseas will from today be eligible to vote in the UK general elections in one of the biggest increases in the country's electoral franchise in a century. The expansion in the electorate follows a change in the law approved by Parliament in 2022, scrapping a previous curb on UK citizens voting if they had lived overseas for over 15 years. Implemented ahead of an election set for later this year, it is the most significant change to the voter rolls since a 1928 law granted women equal voting rights and a 1969 move to lower the voting age to 18 from 21. Britons worldwide will now be able to register to vote online, regardless of how long they have been overseas. Under UK election law, once registered, they will also be permitted to donate to political parties and campaigners. 
The government estimates this change could enfranchise around 3.5 million people, nearly treble the 1.3 million votes. That was the winning margin in the 2016 referendum on European Union membership. It remains unclear how many of the newly eligible UK citizens living overseas will successfully register to vote. They will need to provide details of the address and time they were last registered to vote or living in Britain. Still ahead, at least one dead has storm hits French Indian Ocean Island. Venezuela's economy grew more than 5% last year, and growth will reach 8% this year. This was revealed by President Nicolas Maduro during his annual address to the government-allied legislature. Podemos informar que el crecimiento económico de Venezuela integral durante el año 2023 superó al 5% del Producto Interno Bruto y fue el mayor crecimiento de América Latina y el Caribe. Otro de los logros y conquistas alcanzadas, materializadas en tiempos de bloqueo, persecución y sabotaje. According to the central bank, inflation reached just under 190% last year, marking an easing from 234% the year before. Maduro said this year the government will continue the policy of stoking national production, recovering national income, and recovering income for workers. He added the state oil company PDVSA contributed $6.23 billion to the country's coffers last year. The figure, which Maduro said funded salaries, health care, education, and housing, corresponded to what the company handed over to the government, not to total earnings. The government foresees a 27% increase in its income from PDVSA this year after a relaxation in the U.S. sanctions and despite stagnant production. Hundreds of thousands of people on France's Indian Ocean island of Reunion hunkered down in their homes under a strict lockdown as a devastating storm ripped along its coast, killing at least one person. Cyclone Bilal hit Reunion, one of France's overseas territories that spanned the globe from the Caribbean to the Pacific, moving in from the northwest in the morning with extreme winds. The eye of the storm passed along the northern and northeastern coast in the afternoon and was moving away from the island by the evening as it headed towards Mauritius. It did not become an intense tropical cyclone or cause devastation further inland, contrary to earlier fears. A full survey of damage, however, had yet to be completed. The island's main Roland Garros airport, a short drive away from Sainte Marie, is to resume flights at 8 p.m. local time on Tuesday. In preparation for gusty winds, authorities initially hoisted the violent level alert, indicating imminent danger early on Monday morning, putting all inhabitants, including the emergency services, on strict lockdown. But later Monday, the alert level was downgraded to red, a move that allowed security and rescue forces to move around without, however, lifting the lockdown for the general population. Over in Brazil, the death toll has risen to at least 12 people, as streets and homes were flooded in Rio de Janeiro state after heavy rains buffed towns last weekend. The rain flooded streets, the capital city's metro line and people's homes, bringing down trees and causing landslides. People walked in the streets with water up to their thighs, asking for help from the authorities. Rio's mayor, Eduardo Paes, announced a state of emergency, while President Luis Inácio Lula da Silva's government offered federal support. Volcanic activity in southwest Iceland appears to have eased yesterday, a day after lava from an eruption flowed into the fishing town of Grintavik, engulfing several homes. A volcanic eruption began early Sunday near Grindavik, southwest of the capital Reykjavik, and two fissures opened up. Large flows of glowing orange lava spewing out from the second crack engulfed at least three houses. Iceland's Department of Civil Protection and Emergency Management said magma from the second and smaller of the two fissures stopped yesterday. It was Iceland's fifth volcanic eruption in under three years. The most recent occurred just weeks ago, on 18th December, in the same region. 
Grindavik's 4,000 residents had been evacuated in November as a precaution. Shortly after 18th December eruption, they were allowed to return for a brief periods. They were authorized to regain their homes permanently on 23rd December, but only a few dozen chose to do so. Iceland is home to 33 active volcano systems, the highest number in Europe. Kicking off our sports segment this afternoon, Malaysia got off to a rocky start in their first appearance at the Asian Cup in 17 years as they fell 4 0 to Jordan with former Kedah Darul Aman FC star Mahmoud Al Mardi emerging as the hero of the chivalrous ones in the Group E action at the Al Janoub Stadium this morning. Jordan, led by Hussein Amota, opened this. Mausa Altamari converted a penalty six minutes later. Jordan widened the gap when Almardi easily tapped in a cross from Yazan Al Naimat, with goalkeeper Ahmad Shihar. Several substitutions in the second half, including bringing on neutralized players Paulo Josue and Muhammadu Sumare, as well as Muhammad Safawi Rashid and Muhammad Abif in January. In another Group E match, South Korea beat Bahrain 3-1 with Paris Saint-Germain's Lee Kang in rescuing his side with a second-half brace at the Jasim bin Hamad Stadium. Jurgen Klinsmann's South Korea are among the favourites for the title in Qatar. Meanwhile, Iraq beat Indonesia 3-1 in their Group D meeting at the Ahmed bin Ali Stadium. Shin Tae Yong's men went ahead in the 17th minute through Muhannad Ali before the Garuda's Marcelino Ferdinand equalized at the 37th minute mark. However, Iraq closed out the first half with a second goal by Osama Rashid. Into the second half, Jesus Casas men launched a barrage of attacks on Indonesia's goal mouth and it was proven fruitful when they managed to add another to the tally through substitute Ayman Hussein. The win saw the 2007 edition champion sit at the second place behind Japan with a goal difference. Indonesia will next take on Vietnam this Friday before closing out their group stages against Japan on 24th January. Lionel Messi was controversially crowned as FIFA's best men's player for 2023, while Aitana Bonmati added to her collection of individual accolades at the awards ceremony in London. Messi claimed the award for the third time, but the 36-year-old was a surprise victor ahead of Erling Haaland on an otherwise glorious night for Manchester City. The award only covered the period after Messi had led Argentina to World Cup glory in December 2022 to August 2023. During that time, the eight-time Ballon d'Or winner had a subdued end to his career at Paris Saint-Germain before joining MLS side Inter Miami in June. Holland was favoured to win after scoring 52 times in his debut season with City as the English side won a treble of Champions League, Premier League and FA Cup. After receiving the same number of points from a scoring system based on votes from national team captains, coaches, journalists and fans, Messi was crowned victor. Messi's former club teammate Kylian Mbappe was third. However, all three of the men's finalists did not attend the ceremony, leaving football legend Terry Henry, who was co-hosting the event, to pick up the award in Messi's absence. Bonmati's selection as the best women's player was never in doubt as she completed a clean sweep of personal awards after helping Spain to win the World Cup and Barcelona to Champions League glory in 2023. The 25-year-old also won the Ballon d'Or, Golden Ball for Player of the World Cup and UEFA's Player of the Year in recent months. On to tennis, Stefanos Tsitsipas produced an extraordinary balletic shot at the clutch moment in his opening match at the Australian Open to help him pass lucky loser Zizou Bergs and into the second round. The Greek seventh seed had lost the opening set to the world number 129th on Raw Lever Arena, but had grabbed a break point at the start of the second when his Belgian opponent sent the ball just over the net. Tsitsipas raced in and reached over into the other side of the court to slap the ball off the ground towards the umpire and win the point, all the while somehow managing to avoid touching the net to avoid being penalized. 
The crowd gasped, and Bergs put his hand over his mouth in astonishment as CC Pass took the break and a two love lead on his way to a 5 7 6 1 6 1 6 3 victory. In other results, Andy Murray was dumped out in the first round by Argentina's Thomas Martin Echeverri, with the Britain losing 6 4 6 2 6 2 in just under two and a half hours. The world number 44 departed Melbourne Park having offered minimal resistance, a defeat that will only elicit further questions about his future. Murray has now lost seven of his last eight matches and he has started the season with a love to record. Meanwhile, former world number no. 6 Felix Auger Aliassim beat Dominic Tem 6375675763 to reach the second round of the Australian Open in a match that ended in an early hours of Tuesday morning. Auger Aliassim was on track for a relatively straightforward victory, up two sets and leading 5 2 in the third set tiebreak before Team roared back into life. In the end, Auger Aliassim broke the Australian's serve in the fifth set to take a three-love lead that proved to be decisive in an exhausting thriller that lasted almost five hours. The team outhit Auger Aliassim by 57 winners to 54, but was ultimately undone by the 66 unforced errors he made compared to his opponent's 54. With his victory, Auger Aliassim drew level with the Austrian at 1-1 in the pair's Lexus ATP head-to-head -head series. Their only previous clash also came to a Grand Slam where Thiem notched a straight set's fourth round triumph en route to the title at the 2020 US Open. The women's singles, Naomi Osaka returned to Grand Slam tennis after maternity leave in the same way she left it, with a first round loss after going down 6-4, 7-6 to Caroline Garcia on Rod Lever Arena. Two weeks ago, after 15 months out, a double fall gave Garcia the first break point in a tight break. Still hitting the mark with her first serves, Garcia raced to a big lead and clinched the win on her first match point when Osaka dumped another backhand into the net. In motorsports, Carlos Sainz of Spain extended his lead over Frenchman Sebastian Loeb to 24 minutes after placing fourth in Monday's eighth stage from Al Daudimi to Heil in South Arabia. Matthias Ekstrom took the first spot off the stage. Swede Ekstrom, whose chances of overall victory were wiped out by suspension problems the previous day, swept into the lead and finished 2 minutes 45 seconds ahead of Audi teammate Stefan Peter Hansel. Another Frenchman, Gillian Chicheret, was third at 3 minutes 10 seconds. Overall, leader Carlos Sainz was fourth at 5 minutes 13 seconds in his Audi to gain more time on his closest challengers, Loeb, who ended up 10th 11 minutes back, and Brazilian Lucas Moraes of Toyota finished 7th 9 minutes 51 seconds behind the winner. Frenchman Loeb was leading by 2.5 minutes after 366 kilometers of the 458 kilometer stage from Al Duwadimi to Ha'il, but went off course, had to double back, and lost time. It is with great sadness that we learn today from his family. In another development, Spanish motorcycle rider Carlos Falcón has died more than a week after crashing in the Dakar rally. Falcón, age 45, had been in induced coma since he was flown to hospital in Riyadh and then back to Spain after falling 448 kilometers into the second stage on 7th January from Al Hanakia to Al Duadimi. Race director David Castera told reporters at the time that the rider, who was competing in the endurance event for the second time after finishing 68th in 2022, had lacked a pulse but was resuscitated by the first doctor to arrive on the scene. Dakar organizers expressed their condolences to his family and friends. Falcon from Tarragona was competing in the unassisted bikers category. The grueling event, being held entirely in Saudi Arabia for the fifth time, has claimed many lives since the first Paris-Dakar rally was held in 1978. Falcon was the 33rd competitor to die, but first since 2022.
transparent and concise. Paparan komprehensif, ringkas dan padat. Saksikan Kanta 744, 744 Malam. Berita Perdana 8 Malam. Malaysia Tonight, 8.30 p.m. And that wraps up World Today. In our top story, Malaysia to call for enhancing unity among NAM and G77 plus China. Tune in to Malaysia Tonight coming up at 8.30 p.m. on TV1 and Saluran Berita RTM. From the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. I'm Otto Othman. Thanks for watching.